Barry, in trying to understand how our brain functions, one of the most significant sources of information that we have, often tragically, are from cases where there's brain damage uh, in one way or another, from stroke, from trauma. Uh, what are some examples uh, when brains go bad that can help us understand when brains are normal? Well, I think that's, that's really become the richest source of understanding how experience is made up of many parts and the cooperation of many systems. Because when brains go bad or when there's brain injury or brain uh, pathology, we see one of the systems damaged. And by taking out that component and seeing what happens to experience, what the experience is like with something missing, we're able to see just how much structure, just how many components go into ordinary experience. Mm -hmm. Here's a case. Um, people with right parietal damage can be put in a very strange position of disowning one of their limbs. So the so-called alien hand syndrome is where somebody says, uh, this isn't my arm. Of course, they can feel the rest of their body as belonging to them, but they say, this isn't my arm. And if the doctor says, whose arm is it? They say, maybe it's yours. I don't know. Now, this, this feeling shows you that uh, although if you, if you put a pin into the hand, there is sensation, there is pain, and in fact, they'll say very strange things. You, you can prick them with a, a pin, some of these patients, and you'll say, is there pain? Yes. Whose pain is it? I don't know. That shows us that it's not enough just to have an experience, to treat it as one of your experiences. There must be something like ownership. You have to lay claim to that experience. Not enough that it's just going on. And yet some very famous thinkers, uh, Wittgenstein in particular, said you couldn't have an experience of pain and wonder whose was pain it? that was. It was conceptually impossible to, to be in that position. But here we're finding patients who are actually in that position, namely that having an experience is not enough to treat it as mine. So we think there must be something in the normal case that... Uh, explains or makes possible ownership of experiences, ownership of one's See, limbs. Pr prior, we would have thought that is self-evident. You don't need a brain system to have ownership. It's so obvious yes. and counterintuitive that it would be the opposite. Yes. But in fact, that's not true. In fact, that's not true. So it's not only our experiences that we have to lay claim to and have ownership of, not only our limbs, although that's a big part of what makes us feel that it's ourselves, but even in thought, turns out that there are strange cases of people, pathologies again, brain damaged patients, who think that they're having thoughts inserted into their minds. This is not the same thing as hearing voices. Mm. It's not happening <clears throat> outside. But they feel that the thoughts that are going on are being broadcast into their mind by someone else. That shows it's not enough to just have a thought, to treat it as my thought, or even to treat it as me. And again, this runs counter to a lot of philosophy. Descartes famously <laughs> says, I think, therefore I am. You yeah. know, if there's thought going on, has to be me. Yeah. No, again, it looks as though, to our surprise, having a thought requires ownership of that thought. So notice that this concept of ownership goes missing in certain pathologies. But then it leads us to ask, in the normal case, what is it that explains that ownership of our own thoughts and of our own limbs? Well, ownership is critical to the concept of agency, where you, you know that you're doing something, that it's, a, it's, it's the you that's doing it. So this uh, ownership then becomes a, a critical function that has evolved to, to provide this, uh, this, uh, this sense of self doing things. Absolutely. It's a crucial part of the sense of self. But now we might distinguish a sense of ownership from a sense of agency, because a sense of agency comes to light and can seen. Can, sorry, because the sense of agency comes to light and can be seen to go wrong when there are other kinds of pathologies. Again, brain damaged patients sometimes have what we call anarchic hand. An anarchic hand is when uh, the arm seems to do things by itself, according to the patient. So it reaches out and grabs a glass or takes a cup, and the person says, "I didn't do that." It wasn't my moving my arm. My arm seemed to move by itself. But it's still your arm. It is still your arm. And so notice you have the ownership. And notice it's still you who's the agent. You are actually acting. But what you've lost is a sense of your own agency. 
you're not realizing that you're the author of that movement. Now here you think that's my limb. It's not, it's not that you're disowning the limb. It's that you're not claiming yeah. agency yeah. for moving it. Yeah. Now, there are very yeah. interesting reasons why agency seems to go missing here. Uh, some people think that when we make a movement, uh, we're predicting not only how the arm will move, but we're predicting the sensations we'll have as a result of grasping a cup. Mm. In other words, you're expecting to feel something on the fingers. This is called the forward model. The idea that the brain is actually preparing and then making a copy of the expected outcome of those movements. Now, when you get sensations at the end of your fingers that match that copy, they cancel each other out and everything's going well. Mm. But now imagine moving your arm and now feeling sensations and movements you didn't expect because you didn't make the copy. Uh, you now get feelings at the end of your fingers that yeah. surprise you. Uh -huh. So you say, I didn't do that, it wasn't me. Uh -huh. So the self of agent, the sense of agency and the sense of ownership collaborate as parts of our bodily awareness mm. that make up a sense of self. Mm. And again, it shows you how it's not enough just to have the conscious mind operating in independence. A large part of what makes it feel like me is this bodily awareness. Mm. What about language that we think is a unified concept? There are so many different modules and in different pathologies and injuries, different little segments of language can be lost, which seem very strange to us because we think of language as a totality and yet there are so many different facets in how we see language or hear language. How does that work? Yes, I think this is, this is again another case where something we thought was a, a unified whole language. There is this thing. It's distinctively human. We have language. We're using it now. People listening to us are, are relying on it. And yet language is made up of many, many, many different systems. And again, through brain pathology, usually stroke, you can see a breakdown in some parts of that system. So sometimes there are people who uh, speak perfectly fluently, but of course what they're, they're actually producing is, is nonsense speech, but not to them, it sounds normal. Other people can only produce telegraphic speech, injuries to Broca's area. You can have people who end up just producing um, one or two word utterances to try and convey what they mean. They've lost the syntactic ability to organize the units into larger parts. But then there are people who lose the ability to hear particular sounds as words. So uh, that's very strange. You would be hearing the noises I'm making now and it would sound almost like a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And again, there are people who cannot, when reading words, cannot pronounce some of the words because uh, they've lost the ability either to do letter by letter composition or they've lost the ability to recognize whole words. Now, we maybe have two systems for reading and they operate rather separately. This is the so-called dual root model of reading. One system recognizes a whole word and the other does the letter by letter composition. Now, when you're relying on letter by letter, uh, you're able to figure out what the word sounds like from the individual parts. But imagine you've lost your whole word recognition. Now you've lost the ability to treat exceptional cases, to treat those anomalous cases where the whole word is pronounced in a way that's not made up by the letters. Yeah. So people with this kind of damage to the brain, when given the word yacht, will say yashed. On the other hand, when people have got whole word recognition but lost letter by letter, when it's a familiar word, they can say it and pronounce it. They can read it. But if you give them a nonsense word, a made-up word like trint or vrib, there's nothing they can do. They can't even utter it. They can't utter it because can't it's, read the not, it's not codified and stored right. in the system. So what this shows is that language has all these very, very specific modules that together integrate into our concept of language. Yes, and they're giving us meaning, they're giving us sound, they're giving us sequence and structure. And, and you again see through brain injury the way in which pull any one of these out and what's left shows you that it's a very composite thing. In fact, most people say familiarly, oh yes, the language centers in the brain, they're on the left-hand <laughs> side. Actually, some people have them on the right. But, but if you ask how many bits of the brain are involved in using speech in the way we are now, probably at least 50 areas are involved. And so when you have stroke, you can have very specific breakdown. And actually that gives you a clue as to how many separate systems are collaborating to make what seems like a unified whole.